Hello, my name is Van de Keizer. I am a neuroradiologist in Ghent University Hospital in Belgium, and welcome to this video presentation on anatomy of the temporal bone. This is quite a complicated topic because the temporal bone contains a lot of very important, very small structures. So this might take a while, but I hope it will be of interest to you and that you will learn something new. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the anatomy of the temporal bone, the gross anatomy of the temporal bone. I'm going to talk about specifically the anatomy of the outer ear, middle ear and inner ear. We're going to talk about the facial nerve, which courses through the temporal bone. And lastly, we're going to talk about some very small canals and fissures that you shouldn't mistake for fractures or other pathological entities. So let's get started with the gross anatomy of the temporal bone. So the temporal bone is one of the major bones of the skull and is a component of both the surface of the skull as well as the skull base, where it is part of the middle temporal uh, fossa. And this is a temporal bone on the lateral surface, and here is a temporal bone situated along the skull base in the middle skull base. The temporal bone consists of various components or several components. We have the squamous part, a very thin part of the temporal bone, which also contains the uh, zygomatic arch or part of the zygomatic arch. Then we have the mastoid part. We have the tympanic part, which constitute the bone bony wall of the uh, external auditory canal. And then when we look at the skull base, we can make a distinction between two major parts. On the lateral side, containing a lot of very small mastoid air cells, we have the mastoid part of the temporal bone. And on the medial side, consisting of a very dense bone and containing the neurovascular structures that are responsible for hearing and or equilibrium, we have the petrous bone or the petrous part. So we have in total five important parts, the squamous part, mastoid part, petrous part, and tympanic part, four parts rather. And then we have two processes. We have the mastoid process located over here, and you can't see it on uh, this uh, three-dimensional reconstruction, but normally we have a small bony protrusion over here, which in some cases can be quite long, which is the styloid process. So let's look at this. These are three-dimensional reconstructions. Uh, let's look at some axial uh, CT images and bone window. So this is the temporal bone. This is an axial slice. And what do we see here? This is the squamous part. Uh, and here we see where normally the zygomatic arch would start. This is the tympanic part, which constitutes the bony wall of the external auditory canal. Then we have the mastoid part, and see there are a lot of very small mastoid air cells over there. And then we have the very dense bone of uh, the petrous part of the temporal bone, which is a bit triangular or pyramid-shaped and uh, articulates with the clivus situated over here, and which co uh, contains, as said, the cochlea, uh, the semicircular canals and the vestibule, and here we see part of the cochlea. Uh, let's look at coronal reconstructions. Uh, this is the left temporal bone. Over here we see the cochlea, we see part of the semicircular canals over here, and this is the petrous part, uh, consisting of a very dense, very compact bone, and over here we have the mastoid part, and look at all those very small mastoid and some larger mastoid air cells. Then over here we have the tympanic part, which as said is uh, the bony wall of the external auditory canal. And we see two cavities or canals or whatever um, in the temporal bone. Over here we have the external auditory canal. And here we see the soft tissues of the oracle or the ear. And here we have the tympanic cavity, which contains the ossicles, the very small bones responsible for transmitting sound from the eardrum to the neurovascular structures of uh, the cochlea. Uh, what is the function or why is the temporal bone so important? Well, the temporal bone is basically responsible for capturing sound waves and translating those sound waves and electrical signals 
which are then uh, transferred to the brain, which is able to analyze it, and that's how we recognize sound. So what do we have? We have the bone, the bony part, the temporal bone, and we have the soft tissues of the ear overlying it, uh, at least the mastoid part, and located within the temporal bone, in the petrous part, we have the cochlea, and not responsible for hearing, but uh, important for equilibrium, the semicircular canals and the vestibule, which I haven't drawn on this image. So uh, how are these electrical uh, signals transmitted to the brain? Well, through the vestibular cochlear nerve, which leaves the temporal bone through the internal auditory canal. Uh, this is the external auditory canal. This is the tympanic cavity. So uh, I set the two holes inside the temporal bone and this is basically what happens so there is sound in the environment our ear captures it it is transferred through the external auditory canal bounces on the eardrum located over here and these sound waves generate well pulsations or kinetic energy so the eardrum vibrates and these vibrations are passed along three ossicles uh, the hammer or malleus the anvil or the incus and uh, the stirrup or stirrups uh, or the stapes and these vibrations are passed along through the cochlea where they make fluid vibrate or uh, they make fluid move inside the cochlea and uh, these fluid movements uh, generate electrical signals and specialized uh, cells located in the cochlea and the, the electrical signal generated is then transferred to the brain through the vestibular cochlear nerve and here are some arrows showing you how sound is eventually translated into electrical energy or electrical impulses and transferred to the brain. So a very important structure. And anatomically, we can divide it in three major parts. We have the outer ear, then we have the middle part, which is called the middle ear, and we have the inner ear, which uh, contains the cochlea and the semicircular canals. And in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to use this division in three parts. So we're going to start with discussion on the outer ear, then we're going to discuss the middle ear, and finally the uh, uh, the middle ear and then finally the inner ear. So here is the inner ear. So the inner ear contains a uh, dense compact bone of the petrous part of the temporal bone. And uh, it also contains the cochlea, vestibule and semicircular canals. Here we have the middle ear, which basically contains the tympanic cavity and the ossicles. And here we have the outer ear containing the external auditory canal and the soft tissue of the auricle. And this is basically the same. So the outer ear contains the auricle or pinna, the external auditory canal. I wouldn't call it the external auditory meatus um, because meatus is just an opening. So I think canal is more appropriate. And the final part of the outer ear is the eardrum, the most medial part. And this is basically the border between the external ear or the outer ear and the middle ear. Then we have the middle ear, which is an air-filled cavity and the petrous bone located between the eardrum and the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. And it contains the ossicles. And finally, we have the inner ear, which contains the bony and the membranous labyrinth. And I'm going to talk more about the difference between the two later on. So basically, the bony labyrinth or bony cavities uh, inside the petrous part, which are shaped like a snail, and that's the cochlea, or which are shaped like small canals, and those would be the semicircular canals. And inside the bony labyrinth, which is filled with fluid perilymph, we also find some sacs and ducts that are filled with another kind of fluid called endolymph. And that's basically what the membranous labyrinth is. And the membranous labyrinth also contains specialized uh, neuronal cells uh, which are responsible for um, uh, detecting movement in the case of the vestibule and the semicircular canals or for detecting sound and translating that in electrical signals that are transferred to the brain. Let's start with the outer ear. What is the outer ear exactly? Well, there's not much I'm going to uh, be able to say about the outer ear because this is 
a presentation just on anatomy, not on pathology. Over here, we have coronal images and axial images of the left temporal bone. And what are the parts of the outer ear? Well, we have the external auditory canal, which consists of a bony part, which is basically uh, the medial half of the medial or the medial two thirds of the external auditory canal. And then we also have a fibrocartilaginous part, which is basically the lateral half or the lateral one third, but depending on how you measure it, of uh, the external auditory canal. And this is basically the canal in which sound waves are uh, transferred to the eardrum, which is then the most medial part of the external auditory canal. Here we have it. The normal eardrum is very, very thin and barely visible. If it's normal, it's barely visible. And it's the border between the inner and the middle ear. So let's talk a bit more about the anatomy of the eardrum. So here we have the eardrum, very thin as set, and it's barely visible. These are extremely magnified images located completely medially inside the external auditory canal, separating the external or the outer from the middle ear. And we see two uh, important anatomical landmarks on these uh, coronal images. Over here we have the scutum uh, and we see that the eardrum is anchored to the tip of the scutum. So the scutum is basically a small bony protrusion on the supramedial surface of the external auditory canal. And uh, then over here, we have the inferior attachment of the eardrum to a small bony protrusion on the inferior wall of the external auditory canal called the tympanic annulus. And we also see that there's a connection to one of the ossicles, namely uh, the malleus. Um, and when the eardrum vibrates, these vibrations are passed along to the malleus, which then passes them along to the other ossicles. And based on the location of the attachment of the malleus, we can divide the eardrum in a so-called pars flaccida, a soft part, or a, you know, a less tense part, and a pars tensa, which is a very tense part of the eardrum. And the location where the handle of the malleus attaches to the eardrum is called the umbo, which is located centrally along the eardrum. Now, let's talk about the middle ear. I told you I wouldn't be able to say a lot about the external ear or the outer ear. We're looking at a coronal image of the left temporal bone over here. And the middle ear is, as already said, the tympanic cavity, the air-filled hole located uh, laterally, and the petrous bone. And it's basically located between the eardrum and the medial bony wall of the tympanic cavity. It consists of three parts and can be, well, it contains the ossicles. And here we see part of the malleus and of the incus, but we'll talk more about the, the anatomy of these structures later on. And it can be divided in three parts, the, ep, the epitympanum, and tympanum as eardrum, so located above the eardrum. Then we have the mesotympanum, the middle part next to the eardrum, and we have the hypotympanum, which is located under the eardrum. Uh, this is a coronal image of the right temporal bone. And what do we see on these images? These are made to illustrate the very thin roof of the epitympanum, which is called the tegmen tympani. And it's an important structure because cholesteatomas, and I'm not going to talk about pathology here, but they tend to arise in this region called the prusak space. And when they become large, they can erode the tegmen tympani. And the tegmen tympani is basically the very thin bony roof, which uh, isolates uh, the middle ear from the intracranial compartment. So on top of that, we would uh, find dura, the dura mater. This is the scutum, we already know the scutum. And uh, this is an important space called Prusak space, which is located between uh, the malleus and between the scutum. And here we have the flaccid part of the eardrum. And cholesteatomas like to arise in this region, making Prusak space a very important anatomical region to expect 
and patients suspected of having a cholesteatoma. Um, let's talk about a very important anatomical landmark. This is definitely something you have seen a lot in your uh, radiological careers because this is an image you can see on basically any CT of the brain when you look at a bony window. This is the so-called ice cream cone, which can be seen on axial CT images of the temporal bone. And it's basically the normal appearance of the middle ear ossicles and the epitympanum on an axial CT scan. And we can uh, recognize two parts. We see the most anterior part, which is a bit round. This is the ball of the ice cream, and this is the head of the malleus. And over here, we have the cone, the body of the incus, with a tapering conical point, which is formed by the short process, and which points towards the so-called aditus at antrum. And the aditus at antrum is basically the entry point from the air-filled cavity of the epitympanum to the mastoid cells. And the first and largest mastoid cell that communicates directly with the epitympanum is called the antrum. So that's why this small opening is called the aditus at antrum. I think I made another drawing of it which will come later on. This is once again the ice cream cone, this, this time an extremely magnified image, and over there we have the head of the malleus, underneath it the body of the incus, and finally over there pointing posteriorly, uh, looking a bit triangular shaped, we have the short process of the incus. And I will talk about uh, the anatomy of the ossicles in a few minutes. Uh, I talked about the aditus at antrum. Uh, these images, uh, I played uh, I played a bit with them. Uh, these are not your uh, typical axial reconstructions. I angled them a bit to make it more clear. Here we have the epitympanum containing the ossicles. Uh, this is the head of the malleus over here. This is part of the incus. And then we have this very large mastoid air cell called the antrum, which is basically the first mastoid air cell uh, we encounter when we leave the impenum and enter the mastoid. And the entry point is called the aditus at antrum, which looks pretty wide here, but that is due to the angulation I uh, used for generating this image. Let's now talk about the anatomy of the ossicles. I'm going to illustrate them on CT images, but before doing so, let's look at this drawing I made. This here, the first ossicle, is the malleus or the hammer. Uh, it articulates with the incus or the anvil, uh, and the joint between both of them is called the incudomalleolar joint. And finally, we have the strips or the stapes, and uh, this one articulates with the incus through the incudostapedial joint. The malleus consists of several important components. We have the head, then we have a very small neck, and finally we have this large part called the manubrium or the handle. The malleus also has a short anterior process, which is uh, very difficult to recognize on images, and a lateral process, which you can sometimes see because it attaches to the eardrum. Then let's talk about the incus. The incus has a pretty large body. Then we have this uh, very short now it's probably going to come later. No, there it is already. We have a short process, uh, which points posteriorly. We've already seen it when talking about the ice cream cone. Then we have the long process, and the long process makes a turn of about uh, of about 90 degrees, and a very small final part. Um, angulated 90 degrees with the long process is called the lenticular process and the lenticular process communicates with the stapes and the stapes consists of uh, several parts as well it has two legs called the posterior cruise and the anterior cruise then we have the so-called foot plate over here it is uh, which basically articulates directly with a small hole in uh, the wall of the tympanic bone, no, not the tympanic bone, the petrous bone, um, and that hole is called the oval window. And basically, it passes along vibrations to the fluid and the cochlea, well, more specifically, the vestibule, but then through the vestibule to the cochlea. That anatomy will come later. And the stapes also has a head which articulates with the lenticular process, and I didn't draw it a very small thin neck.
Now, let's uh, visualize the anatomy of the ossicles on CT images. This is a coronal uh, image through the right temporal bone. I magnified it a bit, and this is a drawing of the malleus. Let's see if we are able to recognize the various components of the malleus. Over here, we have the head of the malleus. Underneath it, we have the neck of the malleus. And then we have the handle or the manubrium, which also contains a lateral process we can't see on these images. Let's now look on axial images and let's go from the top to the bottom. So we start with some superior slices and we move down uh, in the image. So what do we see here? Here we have the malleus head, so the ice cream of the ice cream cone. And then we have over here a very thin malleus neck. Whoops. And then we have the manubrium, and here we see the lateral process articulating directly with the eardrum. So this is the manubrium and the lateral process, and this is the most distal part of the manubrium, and see how it articulates or is attached to the eardrum in the so-called umbo. Let's now talk about the Incus. Over here we see coronal images once again of the right temporal bone. To see the Incus we have to, if we look at coronal images, uh, the malleus is the most anterior ossicle, so we have to uh, scroll a bit posteriorly to encounter the Incus, and I angulate these images a bit to visualize the most important components of the Incus in one image. So if you do standard reconstructions it probably won't look exactly like this, but it is, this is to give you an idea. So we have a very large body, we have a long process, and the long process uh, angulated 90 degrees with the long process. We have the short lenticular process, which articulates with the stapes, and we can see it. It's very flimsy, but this is the stapes articulating with the lenticular process. Now let's look at axial images, and once again, we move from top to bottom. So over here, we have the head of the malleus, and underneath it, we have the body of the incus, and then uh, pointing posteriorly the short process. We didn't see it on the coronal image, but we see it now on these axial images. Then underneath the neck and the manubrium uh, of the malleus, we find the long process. And here the long process has made a turn of about 90 degrees, uh, changing into the lenticular process. And we also see it over here on these magnified images. And these clearly also show the stapes uh, and this is the incudo stapedial joint, so between the lenticular process and the head of the stapes. Let's use the same image to visualize the anatomy of the stapes. Let's magnify it a bit. So this is the stapes, clearly recognizable um, as uh, something looking like stirrups. And this is the stapes and a drawing I made. So let's look again at the anatomy. Over here we have the lenticular process. This is the manubrium of the malleus. And over here we have the anterior cruise and the posterior cruise of the uh, stapes. Then we have the footplate articulating with the oval window and this structure over here is the vestibule, and here we have the head and the neck of the stapes, uh, which articulate with the lenticular process. This is the oval window, so the footplate is anchored in the oval window, so um, a, a kind of hole inside the petrous bone uh, along the medial wall of the tympanic cavity, and basically sound waves are translated into uh, fluid motion in the vestibule and then passed along because the vestibule is connected to the cochlea, passed uh, further along to the cochlea. So this is the anatomy of the ossicles. Uh, are there other structures I want to discuss? Yes. If you look at this magnified image, a coronal image of the right temporal bone, we have over here the malleus quite clearly. Here we see a very small ligament. And if you look very carefully, there's a very tiny, tiny one here. This is the superior malleolar ligament, and this uh, would be the medial or anterior. I'm not really sure because uh, these structures are so tiny that, that I decided not to include them in this presentation. But this structure, I want you to know what is that. That is the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. And the tensor tympani muscle is a muscle 
that is responsible for basically damping the vibrations of the malleus when exposed to very loud noises. And over here we see the eardrum, which is attached to the manubrium of the malleus. So the tensor tympani is a very small muscle. It basically, uh, the muscle is basically located in the cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube uh, on the superior surface and it has a very small slender tendon which reflects laterally at a small bony protrusion called the cochleariform process to insert on the neck of the malleus and as said its function is to dampen excessive sound vibrations and this muscle is innervated by the trigeminal nerve so here we have the malleus here we see very small part of the incus, the body of the incus, and this here is the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. There's an, um, and this is the anatomy of the tensor tympani muscle and tendon on axial images. Let's start from bottom to top. This is an axial view of the right temporal bone. You see this air-filled canal over here. This is the eustachian tube, and this is basically a communication between the middle ear and the nasopharynx. And at the nasopharyngeal end, it can open and close, and basically this canal is responsible for making sure that the sound pressure in the middle ear remains normal. We all know, we all know what happens if you're in an airplane, uh, you start getting this uh, strange feeling inside your ears and then you swallow a couple of times and it disappears again. That's because the pressure changes in the middle ear uh, if you uh, ascend into the air in an airplane, but by swallowing you open the eustachian tube and the pressure normalizes again. Now, uh, oh, and we're going from bottom to top. I uh, misspoke. So this is uh, inferiorly uh, at the location of the middle ear. And as we uh, scroll superiorly, suddenly we see this soft tissue structure. And this is basically the muscle of the tensor tympani located in a small canal uh, at the superior part of the eustachian tube. We also see it over here. And if we look at the most inferior image, here we have the tensor tympani muscle here we have a very small, here it makes an angle of about 90 degrees at a very small bony protrusion. This is the cochleariform process and this is the tendon attaching to the neck of the malleus. Uh, an important reference point would be this structure over here and what is that? That's the carotid canal. So the eustachian tube basically runs laterally off and parallel to the carotid canal as does the muscle of the tensor tympani. So that's an important or an easy way to find it or to recognize it. And over here we have once again the tensor tympani muscle. This is the cochleariform process. And here uh, we have an angle of about 90 degrees with a small slender tendon inserting on the neck of the malleus. Let's discuss another important but a very small muscle located in the temporal bone. It's not easy to find, but uh, that's why temporal bone is so fascinating. All these small structures, it's a pleasure to know that anatomy and to play along with it. Over here, we have the stapes and this here. Uh, so this is the epitympanum. These are, this is the posterior part. So we're looking at an axial image of the left temporal bone. So this is the anterior part of the epitympanum and this is the posterior part. And we have like this bony protrusion, which is a bit shaped like a pyramid. It's a bit triangular. And and it's called the pyramidal eminence and located inside it we see the soft tissue structure let's remove the collar for a while what is that that's a muscle that's the stapedius muscle and the stapedius muscle is the smallest skeletal muscle in the body it has a very small tendon uh, which we most of the times can't see uh, i don't think i've ever really seen it but it's there and it attaches to the posterior part of the stapes anywhere along the posterior part of the stapes and its function is also to dampen excessive vibrations of the ossicles so let's uh, here is some text so the stapedius muscle located over here is the smallest skeletal muscle in the human body and it has a very small tendon which arises from this hollow uh, located inside the pyramidal eminence 
and inserts on the neck of the stapes. Now we see a structure located next to it. What is that? That's not the stapedius muscle. Located next to the stapedius muscle, we find the facial nerve, which also courses through the temporal bone. And I will talk, I will talk about facial nerve anatomy later on. For now, it suffices that you're able to distinguish the two. So we have here the soft tissue structure located inside the pyramidal eminence, the stapedius muscle, and then over here we have the facial nerve. So the stapedius muscle muscle is innervated by the facial nerve, uh, which makes sense because they're so close together. And as said, it dampens out oscillations. So if you have facial nerve dysfunction, one of the symptoms can be a hyperacusis. So hearing very loud sounds because this muscle no longer functions properly and does no longer dampen uh, the vibrations of the stapes. Then on this same slide, we can see very two very small spaces, which are nevertheless very important. And why is that? Because these spaces located along the posterior surface of the epitympanum or blind spots for the otolaryngologist. So if cholesteatoma surgery is performed, it's very important as a radiologist to look at these structures to see if there's tumor in it because the otolaryngologist might miss it. And what are these structures? Well, we have the pyramidal eminence located medially of the pyramidal eminence. We have a hollow called the sinus tympani and located on the lateral side, we have the so-called facial recess. So always scrutinize these very small spaces located on both sides of the pyramidal eminence on the posterior surface of the tympanic cavity for potential pathology, especially a cholesteatoma that has extended into these structures. We are now looking at an axial image of the left temporal bone. And why am I showing it? Well, here we have the stapes. We already know the stapes by now. This is the vestibule. And as said, the footplate of the stapes is anchored in a defect. We can't really see it as a defect over here. It is very small and has to do with the angulation. Uh, but we have a very small defect or a very small hole uh, called the oval window, which contains or in which the footplate of the stop is, is anchored. And it's important to be able to recognize it. So the oval window is a very small hole where it's kidney shaped actually and covered by a small membrane opening in a tympanic bone. And basically it connects the middle ear to the vestibule. And in this way, the cochlea is basically connected to the ossicles. And that's basically why this is an important structure because it's, uh, it allows the transmission of sound sound waves from the ossicles to the cochlea. So sound is basically transferred from the outer ear to the middle ear to finally the inner ear. And the stop is, is as said, attached or anchored in the oval window. Um, and in the rim, you find the annular ligament keeping the stop is foot plate in place. And this is the vestibule and this is the cochlea and the vestibule is connected to the cochlea but that will come later and this is a coronal image now i'm going to show you another important hole inside the uh, petrous bone and that is the round window and here we see it this is the basal turn of the cochlea more on cochlear anatomy later on and here we see a very small defect or a very small hole the round window and what is the function of the round window well this is how you will mostly see it because i uh, especially i made this reconstruction especially for this presentation this is not a standard reconstruction this is what you can see on a standard ct or the brain or a ct of the temporal bone this is the basal turn of the cochlea and over here we have the round window so it's located laterally at the basal turn of the cochlea and as said sound waves are translated into uh, motion of the fluid inside the inner ear structures and this uh, builds up some pressure we get pressure inside the inner ear structures and this uh, pressure or this energy is dissipated once again through the round window. And assessing the round window is important, especially in patients that are candidates for a cochlear implantation, because it is uh, the cochlear implant, uh, the cochlear electrodes are inserted inside the cochlea through the uh, round window. So we have to make sure that there is no ossification over here, for instance, because of um, 
uh, labyrinthitis ossificans uh, or something like that. So always look if the round window is patent or open. And then we get finally to the inner ear. So the inner ear contains the cochlea, the semicircular canals, the vestibule. And what is the bony labyrinth? I already said it. It's basically a complex space, uh, basically uh, complex openings centrally in the dense compact bone of the inner ear. And we can distinguish three important components, the cochlea shaped like a snail. Then you have the semicircular canals and you have the vestibule. And you're filled with fluid called perilymph, which is secreted by the periosteum because uh, these are bony cavity, so they are lined by periosteum. Perilymph is secreted by the periosteum and it looks a bit like lymph fluid elsewhere in the body. I made a drawing of the various components of the bony labyrinth over here. And as I said, bony labyrinth is basically periosteum lined bony spaces and the inner ear filled with perilymph fluid. And the membranous labyrinth is located inside the bony labyrinth. And these are basically a collection of sacs and ducts that are all interconnected and are filled with another kind of fluid called endolymph and also contain the sensory end organs for hearing and our vestibular functions. And the hearing function is located inside the cochlea and vestibular functions are located in the vestibule and the semicircular canals. But these are all interconnected to one another. So here we have the cochlea containing our hearing organ and the vestibular system consists of the vestibule, which contains two endolymphatic structures called the utricle and saccule, but we can't see those on a CT of the temporal bone. We can we can't even see them on an MRI unless it's um, a patient with Meningeal disease and the patient received a special kind of MRI to visualize them. Uh, but I'm not going to talk much about pathology here. So in normal situations, we can't see them on MRI either um, and definitely not on CT. And then we have the semicircular canals. Those are three canals, eh, which are semicircular, as the name implies, which are uh, angulated um, in angles of about 90 degrees on one another, all connected to the vestibule, and those are important for detecting body movement, while the vestibule is mainly for detecting head movement. And here we have the components of the membranous labyrinth once again. Let's start by talking about the cochlea. I have to, uh, I have a confession to make. I always found cochlear anatomy very difficult because you always read in textbooks uh, and on radiopedia and in articles that the cochlea has two and a half or two and three quarters of a turn but i always found it very difficult to tell which turn is what exactly and it's one of those of those things I never dare to confess to anyone. So I never dare to ask anyone from, could you please show me uh, how these turns actually turn around? What are the turns of the cochlea? So for this presentation, I had to look it up because uh, I don't want to tell you stories. So I actually had to look it up and I tried to understand it by looking at the pathological specimens of the cochlea. And this is a pathological substrate. This is basically a cast made of the cochlea and this would be the first turn of the cochlea. So the cochlea is a bit shaped like a snail. Then this is the second turn or the middle turn. So the first turn is called the apical turn. The second turn is the middle turn. And then we have the basal turn. And look, it's not complete. So we only have like half a turn, half and a bit. So maybe half, maybe three quarters, depending on... Um, uh, how you look at it. And let's now compare a coronal reconstruction I made with this pathological specimen. And it's quite clear that on this image, we mainly see the basal turn and the apical and middle turn well, they're difficult to distinguish from one another, which also has to do with the fact that it's impossible to visualize the entire cochlea in one slice because um, these uh, turns are located on top of each other. So it's not like they're all located inside the same plane. So if we look at this image, this here would constitute both the apical and the middle turn. So corresponding to what we see over here, and most of what we see is the basal turn 
of the cochlea. Now, this is a reconstruction I made especially for this presentation. Let's look at some images that are more uh, the kind of images we see daily. So this is the cochlea. This is your standard reconstruction of a CT of the temporal bone. Uh, this is an axial view of the right temporal bone. And an important reference uh, point would be the internal auditory canal through which the vestibulocochlear nerve and facial nerve uh, enter the temporal bone after they exit the brainstem, which we can't see on these bony reconstructions. So I drew it, the approximate course of the vestibulocochlear nerve, and it will enter uh, the cochlea over here in a structure called the cochlear aperture, which is an opening in the distal internal auditory canal that basically transmits the cochlear nerve. So the vestibular cochlear nerve consists of three components, the cochlear nerve, the superior vestibular nerve and the inferior vestibular nerve, and the cochlear nerve is transferred to the cochlea uh, through the cochlear aperture. And here we have a dense bony structure, which is called the modiolus. This is a spongy bone located at the center of the cochlea, which contains the spiral ganglion. So it basically contains nerve cells, axons, and so on. It contains nervous structures. Um, these are magnified axial images of the cochlea. And now, what are the very, what are the several turns of the cochlea? This is difficult. I always found it difficult because as said, it's impossible to visualize the cochlea in one plane, to see all the turns in one plane. So we have to play along with it. And to make it easy, I once again uh, looked up a pathological specimen. This is what the cochlea looks like. This is a cast made of a real human cochlea. And I think it's normally angulated a bit like this. And if we then uh, look at the CT images and we try to figure out where the slice went through, uh, and I'm also showing you a coronal reconstruction to help you understand what we're looking at, then let's imagine we make a CT slice to this part of the cochlea. Well, this will just be basal turn. And that is what we see here on this image over here, the basal turn of the cochlea. And we also see part of it over here. Then if we go uh, a couple of slices higher, then we probably we see a combination of both the apical turn and the middle turn. So this is probably a combination. Here we see still some leftovers of uh, or some partial volume of the basal turn, which is also present in this slice. And then here we have a combination of the apical and middle turn, and it's very difficult to distinguish them from one another. And the same applies for this slice. This is probably a combination of the apical and middle turn, and this is probably still part of the basal turn where it goes over in the middle turn. And then on this last slide, the most superior one, we basically go to the middle turn once again. So what we see here is mainly middle turn of the cochlea. So I hope this helps you understand cochlear anatomy a bit. I found this very useful for myself because as said, I always had difficulties understanding the anatomy of the cochlear turns. Now let's look at some other structures that are important. This here is uh, the basal turn. And we see a very, very, very flimsy uh, hyperdense structure. This is bone. This is called the spiral lamina. And the spiral lamina is a very small bony structure that basically divides the cochlea into two parts, an upper part and a lower part. And the upper part is called, oh, that's coming later. And over here, we see the dense spongy bone of the modiolus containing the spiral ganglion, so containing nerve cells, axons, and so on, and so on neuronal structures. So this is the basal turn of the cochlea. Here we see the spiral lamina, and this is the lower part, uh, the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. And these are basically cavities filled with perilymph. This is a uh, drawing I made of cochlear anatomy. Uh, let's assume we make a slice in the uh, coronal plane through the cochlea. What would it look like? Probably a bit like this. This would be the apical turn. Uh, this would be the middle turn. And this would be the basal turn of the cochlea. So centrally, we have the dense spongy bone of the modiolus and this contains nerve cells axons and so on of the cochlear nerve 
And then this modiolus has very small bony extensions, and that's basically what the spiral lamina is. I didn't really drew it on this image, but you have to imagine that along these uh, axons over here, which you can see that these are located in a very small thin bone, the spiral lamina. And the spiral lamina basically divides uh, the turns into two sides, silted pale limbs, the upper side and the lower side, and also located, and this drawing is not completely accurate, it's basically located along the upper part, we have a structure filled with endolymph called the scala media, and we find that everywhere. So this would be the upper part, the scala tympani, and this would be the scala vestibuli, and then over here we have the scala media. The scala media is part of the membranous labyrinth, is filled with endolymph, and contains the corti uh, organ, which basically contains the nerve cells. That's well, you have to imagine that the fluid here is moving around, vibrating, and this causes vibrations in the scala media as well. And it makes these uh, hair cells move, and by moving, they generate electrical signals, which are captured by the axons and transmitted to the cochlear nerve and to the brain. Uh, an another important anatomical landmark I didn't talk about yet is the so-called cochlear promontory. And what is that exactly? Well, basically, we have this um, kind of, um, how, how do you say it in English? Uh, it looks a bit like a small bony protrusion located uh, medially along the basal turn of the cochlea. So it's, it's, it's as if uh, the petrous bone protrudes a bit inside the tympanic cavity at the location of the basal turn of the cochlea. Let's now talk about the vestibular system. So in the vestibular system, we have two important components, the vestibule containing the utricle and the saccule, and important for detecting head movement, and three semicircular canals for detecting body movement. We have the superior semicircular canal, we have the horizontal semicircular canal, and while I'm not good at uh, drawing three-dimensional images. So you have to imagine this one is pointing posteriorly and is the posterior semicircular canal. And let's now try to find those on CT images. This is a coronal image of the left temporal bone. Over here, we have the vestibule and the vestibule uh, contains the oval window, and over here we expect to see the stapes, but it's not very clear right now. And this is the superior semicircular canal, so it turns upwards, uh, so we only see part of it, of course. We don't see the two legs. This is the upper part of the superior semicircular canal, and here we see one of the legs of the horizontal semicircular canal. So in the coronal plane, we can easily distinguish the superior and horizontal semicircular canal. Let's now look at the anatomy um, on axial images of the left temporal bone, and let's move from bottom to top. So we start with the vestibule located over here, an important reference point, and then we see a structure located uh, along the posterior margin and pointing posteriorly, so this is the posterior semicircular canal. If we go a couple of slices higher, we have once again over here the vestibule, and then we have this canal, semicircular canal, now pointing of uh, it's uh, horizontally uh, pointing a bit laterally uh, and this is the uh, it's coming later this is the horizontal semicircular canal and here so we started with the posterior semicircular canal it's making a turn over here so here is the posterior semicircular canal if we go a couple of slices higher what do we see so we can no longer see the horizontal semicircular canal we will still see components of the posterior semicircular canal and another canal is appearing this is going to be the superior semicircular canal so this is the posterior semicircular canal this is the superior semicircular canal and these have a common cruise this is the common cruise of the superior and the posterior semicircular canal so they basically share a leg if you want to. Uh, let's go a couple of slices higher still. What do we see? Once again, the superior semicircular canal, and this is the posterior semicircular canal, and this is the common cruise. And when we move a higher still, the only thing that is still detectable is the superior semicircular canal. And here we see the top of the superior semicircular canal. Uh, there is a condition called uh, the hissons of the superior semicircular canal, in which the bony covering is gone. 
Uh, this is a pathological condition, uh, can lead to uh, vertigo, especially when uh, hearing sounds. Uh, this is a so-called third window situation. We have two windows, the oval and the round one. And if the bone is gone over here, we get a so-called third window, but more on that in my future presentation on pathology of the temporal bone. Let's now look at these structures and the coronal view. This is the left temporal bone, and let's go from front to back. So so we start uh, anteriorly and we will move posteriorly. What do we see over here? Well, this one pointing upwards is the superior semicircular canal, and this will be part of the horizontal semicircular canal. If we go a bit to the back, we see the vestibule, of course, and we still see part, oh, and the vestibule communicates with the cochlea, and here we see that communication. I already said it a couple of times. This is the horizontal semicircular canal, and here upwards is the superior semicircular canal. Here we see once again the vestibule and the cochlea, and these very small, um, well, let's call them holes, uh, or this is the horizontal semicircular canal, so it's making a turn over here. And this is the turn of the superior semicircular canal and the coronal plane. And once again, we have the vestibule, the horizontal and the superior semicircular canal. And here, still vestibule, uh, horizontal and superior semicircular canal. I think it's clear now. And finally, we are seeing the posterior limbs of both these structures. This is the posterior part of the horizontal semicircular canal and this of the superior semicircular canal. So we started by looking at the anterior limbs of these canals and we ended with the posterior limbs, which makes sense, of course. And if we were to scroll even further backwards, what would we see then? Well, pointing posteriorly, the posterior semicircular canal, we're going to start with the last image of the previous slide in which we saw the posterior leg of the horizontal semicircular canal and well this is then the common cruise of the superior and posterior semicircular canal and if we scroll further backwards we have here the posterior semicircular canal and here it's making its turn so that's it for anatomy of the inner ear. Let's now talk about the anatomy of the facial nerve. And the facial nerve courses to all parts of the temporal bone or many parts of the temporal bone, so I can't really discuss, discuss that specifically in the inner ear or middle ear or outer ear. This is the internal auditory canal. And in the internal auditory canal, I'm first going to illustrate the various components of the facial nerve. It has uh, several segments. The component of the facial nerve coursing through the internal auditory canal now would be the canalicular segment and we can't see it on a CT image. Then we have a very small segment, uh, it's making a turn anteriorly located above the inner ear structures which is called the labyrinthine segment because it's in close pro proximity to the bony labyrinth. Then here we have like it looks a bit like a, a nodule. This is basically the geniculate ganglion of the facial nerve. And then, we can't see it on these images, but uh, then it's, uh, the facial nerve makes a posterior turn once again. And this is the tympanic segment. And the tympanic segment is located along the medial wall or along the lateral wall. Uh, I would have to say, of the tympanic cavity. And then we have a component of the facial nerve coursing through the mastoid bone, which is the mastoid segment. So we have four components, the canalicular segment, labyrinthine segment, tympanic segment, and the mastoid segment. Let's now try to visualize those segments on uh, CT images. These are actual images of the left temporal bone, and we're going from top to bottom. So this is an important reference point. Once again, the internal auditory canal. Uh, then here courses the canalicular segment, of course. Then we have the anterior turn of the labyrinthine segment, a very short segment. We see over here the geniculate ganglion. And then if we go a slide lower, then we see here still a very small part of the labyrinthine segment. This is the geniculate ganglion situated over here. And here we see the this is the geniculate ganglion. And here we have the tympanic segment. So the tympanic segment is located superlaterally of the oval window, which will be situated here. Uh, look, we are at the level of the epitympanum. You can see the ice cream cone over there. And if we go a couple of slices lower still, now it becomes difficult, but here we have the pyramidal eminence. 
uh, this is the staphylius muscle, this is the stapes. So this structure over here is the facial nerve, and we are now entering the mastoid, so I'm already calling it the mastoid segment. And well, it's very difficult to detect the facial nerve if you can't scroll through your images, so you just have to believe me, this is the mastoid segment, and it will uh, leave the mastoid bone in a small um, foramen located on the inferior surface of the mastoid part of the temporal bone called the stylomastoid foramen. Uh, these images uh, are further uh, illustrations of facial nerve anatomy. Here we have the labyrinthine segment. Then we have the geniculate ganglion. And what is important? Well, most of the facial nerve will make a turn posteriorly and become the tympanic segment. But we also have a very small branch of the facial nerve, which will uh, run anteriorly in a very small canal, uh, the so-called fallopian canal, which is the canal for the greater petrosal nerve of the facial nerve. And we can also see that if we look for it on CT images. Uh, and I, all, all, I really like it to discover these very small structures. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve is uh, easily detected on coronal images as well, because it's typically located superlaterally of the oval window. So here we have the oval window, and it's typically located immediately underneath the horizontal semicircular canal. So this very small structure over here, here we have the internal auditory canal, and here we have the tympanic segment. And look, here you see once again the connection between the vestibule and the cochlea. Nice, isn't it? And on, the, on this image, we see the, uh, I think we are now scrolling uh, anteriorly. Here we see the labyrinthine segment. And notice that the labyrinthine segment is located very closely to the cochlea. So this would be the apical and middle turn of the cochlea. And here we see most of the basal turn or a large part of the basal turn. And in some cases, pathological cases, you can see that there is no bone located between the facial nerve and the cochlea, a condition called uh, facial cochlear dehiscence, but more on that in our part on pathology. And this structure over here is then the tympanic segment. And if we were to scroll even further forwards, which uh, I'm not going to do, these two structures would come together in the geniculate ganglion. These are coronal images uh, of the right temporal bone, and they're going from front to back. And the most anterior component is, of course, oh, this is an important reference point, but it's located somewhere in the middle, the internal auditory canal. And as said, you can easily detect the tympanic segment of the facial nerve if you look on coronal images at the level of the internal auditory canal. It's located supralaterally of the oval window located over here. And we also see a very small part of the round window on these images and even more over here. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is the geniculate ganglion, so basically the most anterior component of the facial nerve on a CT of the temporal bone. And then if we scroll uh, a bit more to uh, the back, then we will see two components, the labyrinthine segment, segment uh, close to the cochlea, and here the tympanic segment, of course. We also see those over here. So this is the labyrinthine segment. This is the tympanic segment. The tympanic segment courses along the wall of the tympanic cavity downwards. Here we see it still coursing downwards. Um, and I think I already called it the mastoid segment. Might be that it's still tympanic. Uh, where's the exact transition? Difficult to see. And this is a coronal image I angulated in such a way that you can see the mastoid segment in, uh, well, not its entirety, but a large part of it. And it's basically also the largest segment of the facial nerve. And it enters or it exits the temporal bone through this foramen over here, which is the stylomastoid foramen. I am finally through with uh, my presentation on temporal lobe anatomy or temporal bone anatomy. Let's now talk about some very small canals and fissures that you should not mistake for pathology. I'm going to talk about the petromastoid canal, the singular nerve canal, the vestibular aqueduct, and the cochlear aqueduct. What is the petromastoid uh, canal, also called the subarcuate canal? It's basically best seen on axial images, but you can also see it on coronal images. Uh, and in this case, I'm showing you an axial image of the right 
temporal bow. And we see here the two components of the superior semicircular canal. So this is a pretty uh, superior slice through the uh, temporal bone. And then we have here this very small canal. And this is the petromastoid canal or subacute canal because it contains the subarcuate artery and vein. And it's a canal connecting the mastoid antrum. So we see the canal going to the mastoid, to the posterior fossa. So here we see it coursing uh, to the posterior fossa. So the most important thing is do not mistake that for a fracture. So the next structure I would like to discuss is this very small structure over here. What is that? This is the internal auditory canal. Here we have the cochlear aperture. This is the middle turn of the cochlea. Here we have the vestibule. And then we see a very small line. What is that? This is the internal auditory canal. This is the canal for the singular nerve. The singular nerve is a very small branch of the inferior vestibular nerve, which courses, which is also called the posterior ampullary nerve, and which basically runs through the posterior semicircular canal and carries information very specifically from the posterior semicircular canal. We can uh, follow its course on these uh, consecutive images. Here we have the canal for the singular nerve. Here we see it as well, and here we see it connecting to the posterior semicircular canal, which I've drawn in yellow for you over here. Then we have some actual images of the right temporal bone, and we see a very small structure uh, coursing uh, to um, well, the, the vestibule and the semicircular canals uh, coursing from laterally to medially, so lateral posteriorly to medio anteriorly. And what is that? It's the vestibular aqueduct. And the vestibular aqueduct contains membranous labyrinth uh, and uh, it ends blindly in a sac called the endolymphatic sac. So the duct located, so the endolymphatic duct located inside the vestibular aqueduct is called the endolymphatic duct. So that's easy. It ends in a blind endolymphatic sac. And the role is a bit unclear, but it probably plays a role and the dynamics of the endolymph. Um, and it can be enlarged. There is a so-called enlarged vestibular aqueduct syndrome, which is associated with neurosensory hearing loss. But more on that in my future presentation on pathology of the temporal bone. And here we also see the vestibular aqueduct. Here we have a very thin line running through the lateral part of the basal turn of the cochlea. This is the cochlear aqueduct. And remember, the vestibular aqueduct contains an endolymphatic uh, membrane or an endolymphatic duct and a sac. The cochlear aqueduct contains a perilymphatic duct, and it probably drains perilymph, perilymph fluid into the subarachnoid space. And it arises typically from the lateral part of the basal turn of the cochlea, more specifically from the scala tympani. And these are reconstructions I made especially to show you the course of the cochlear aqueduct on uh, in the right temporal bone. So these are not perfect coronal images. I angulated angulated them in such a way that we can see most of the cochlear aqueduct. And the most important thing is do not mistake it for pathology or a fracture. So when uh, discussing a very general topic like this, it's impossible to provide you with key messages. Uh, it's a lot of anatomy, uh, maybe a lot at once. If you want a copy of the slides, you can always ask me. I have no problem sharing. Uh, do not panic if I do not reply to your emails immediately. I'm a bit sloppy, but in the end, I reply to everyone. I really do, but uh, sometimes it takes me a week before I decide to answer my emails. Uh, I I get a lot of them. Um, if you want to know more for self-study, this is an excellent book on temporal bone imaging. I actually read it. Uh, Mark Lammerling is a colleague of mine. He really knows his stuff. Uh, so an excellent book, I can only advise it. And some very good overview articles on temporal bone anatomy and pathology uh, for if you want to study this on your own and if you want to know more. So this concludes my presentation on anatomy of the temporal bone. I hope you find it uh, or found it useful. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, you can leave a comment uh, in the comment section or you can send me an email neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. And this is something my little boy told me I should say at the end. Well, basically he said at the start, but I'm going to say it at the end of every presentation I do a like, 
and subscribe. So thank you very much. I'm now a professional YouTuber. Goodbye.